I believe the devil's greatest achievement is convincing people that they're on their way to heaven when really they are on their way to hell. When you can get someone into a place where they're convinced they're going to heaven and they're no longer willing to, you know, test what they believe to make sure they're on their way to heaven. When someone's in that spot, there's nothing you can do if they're deceived. It's like if someone was walking towards a cliff and they believe in their mind, they're convinced that there is no cliff, that they're going to keep walking on and everything's going to be fine and all right. They're convinced of it. You can run up to that person and you can tell them that there's a cliff, but unless they're willing to examine the path they're walking, unless they're willing to test what they know, they're just going to continue on and they're going to walk right off that edge. And in the same way, if you are not willing to examine the path you are walking on to make sure you're on the narrow path to heaven and not on the broad way to hell, there's a chance that you might just end up in hell. And see, for me personally, I thought I was on the narrow path to heaven. I thought I was saved. I thought I was a Christian. But when I examined that path, I realized I was not saved. I was on my way to hell. And the whole time I was convinced I was going to heaven. And it's a horrifying place to be in to realize that you thought your whole life you were Christian, but really the Bible says otherwise. I want to present to you today the five greatest deceptions within the church. And these are in just about every single church in America and around the world. And you're going to think I'm crazy for thinking these things or believing that these are deceptions. Please hear me out. I am the guy warning you that there is a cliff ahead and that these beliefs, these five deceptions, almost always lead to people ending in eternal destruction. Examine the arguments and the verses I'm going to present and see if what I am saying is the truth. Here are the five great deceptions. Deception number one, we are born sinners with a sin nature. Deception number two, we can't stop sinning and will sin till the day we die. Deception number three, Jesus' blood slash righteousness covers our past, present, and future sins. Deception number four, all you have to do is accept what Jesus did for you or simply believe. And deception number five, once you are saved, you are always saved even if you sin. And what we are going to do is take a look at each one of these deceptions and expose them with God's word. So it's commonly taught in churches that when Adam and Eve sinned, it brought a curse upon all of humanity that each and every one would be born as a sinner with a sin nature. And that because of this, now we will remain sinners till the day we die, until we get to heaven. No matter what we do, we are going to sin because of this. But when we take a look at Genesis chapter 3, this is not what we see. When we look at what happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the curses were that the snake has got to crawl on its belly, that the woman is going to have pain in childbirth, that Adam's going to have to work really hard for his food. From dust he will come, to dust he will return, meaning there will be death. And then they are also kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But nowhere in Genesis chapter 3 did God curse humanity with a sin nature or original sin or being born as a sinner. It's not in Genesis 3. God never does that. It is made up. The only proof that people have that there's a sin nature or you're born a sinner is by cherry picking verses out of the Bible. Picking one verse from Psalms and another verse maybe from Romans chapter 3. The fact is, Genesis 3, the ground zero of sin nature and being born sinners, God never curses Adam and Eve. It says in 1 John 3, verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So we see from the Bible that you can't be a sinner unless you transgress the law. Sin is transgression of the law. Therefore, in order to be a sinner, you must break God's law. But here's the problem. Science shows us that life begins at conception. At the moment of conception, that is when human life begins. That is a human being at conception. Though he's not fully formed, he is a human being. He doesn't have brain waves. He doesn't have a heartbeat. He can't even necessarily think 
yet he is still a human being. But here's the problem. How can that human being commit sin at the moment of conception when it doesn't even have when he doesn't even have brain waves? The fact is you can't. And if sin is transgression of God's law, you can't be born a sinner. Without breaking God's law, you cannot be considered a sinner. Therefore, you can't be born as a sinner unless you have broken God's law, which there is no command of God that you can break at the moment of conception. And we constantly see through the Bible that babies, that youth are born innocent. They are born not having knowledge of good and evil. The Bible makes it clear that man is made upright, but he has sought out many schemes. He has sought out sin. It says, we like sheep have gone astray. We were innocent, but we went astray from God. And then through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled. We return to favor with God. We are born innocent, not having done any good or evil. And through the temptations of the devil, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it's not that you're born a sinner because of Adam and that it's Adam's fault. It is your fault for your sin. You went for the temptation. You decided to sin. And that is why you will be held accountable for your actions. The second deception is that people say that you can't stop sinning till the day you die, that we'll always be sinners. Like I said before, a lot of people attribute that to the sinful nature, original sin, which is a lie, but people still think that you can't stop sinning, that you can't even stop sinning for one day. But that's actually not what the Bible shows us. It says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That verse promises us that we will never be tempted so strong than what we can handle. We can always handle the temptation that comes our way. We are never forced into sin. And with each temptation, God has provided a way to escape it, so that way you can bear it. Because when it comes to sin, you have a free choice. You have a free choice to sin and a free choice not to sin. You can take God's way of escape or you can go after sin and after your worldly pleasures. What it comes down to is your choice. Do you love God or do you love sin? Because if you love God, the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love him, you're going to obey him. But if you love sin and you love the devil, you will obey him. And we can actually see in the Bible that there were many people who lived holy, perfect, righteous lives. In Genesis 6, verse 9, Noah is called perfect. And if you actually look at that word perfect, it is translated as sound, wholesome, unimpaired, innocent, having integrity of God's way. In Job 1.8, God tells Satan that Job is perfect and upright. And if we look at that word perfect, again, it is translated as complete, morally innocent, having integrity. Now, this is not to say that people will never fall into sin, but it is saying at those moments in time, those people were living sinless, perfect lives. Otherwise, Noah would be destroyed with the rest of the world because the rest of the world was sinning. And God and Satan wouldn't have made that deal because if Job was just like everyone else, then there's nothing for God to tell Satan. Satan doesn't need to try and make someone fall who's already fallen. But we also see in Luke 1 verses 5 through 6 that Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. In Luke 23, 50, we see Joseph, the man who buried Jesus, was a good man and a just. In Acts 23, 1, Paul says he has lived in all good conscience before God. And before you go ahead and start saying Romans 7, be sure to watch our video explaining the context of Romans 7 down in the description. In 1 John 3, verse 22, John says that he keeps God's commandments and does what is pleasing in God's sight. These are just a few examples of people who were living holy, righteous, perfect lives, living sin-free, obeying Christ. Deception number three, Jesus' blood covers our past, present, and future sins. Basically put, people believe that when Jesus died, his righteousness was transferred to us and that it covers us like a, like a blanket. So that way, God sees us as righteous even though we are sinning every single day. 
The problem is, this belief goes contrary to God's word. It says in 1 John 3, verses 7 through 8, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we see, it's not he who is covered in Christ's righteousness that is righteous, but he who does what is right is righteous. And if you commit sin, it says he that sins is of the devil. You can't be committing sin and be righteous because he that sins is of the devil. And he who does what is right is righteous. You are either one, a sinner, or you're the other, you're righteous. Now, when it says he who does what is right is righteous, it's not saying with your own self-righteousness and you don't need God and Jesus' death was pointless. That is not what it's saying. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except through him. But we must understand how we receive that blood of Christ. It says in 1 John 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, or walk in righteousness, as he is in the light, as he is righteous, that is when the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all the sins we've committed. So when you turn from that sin and you obey Christ, the blood of Jesus is applied, it washes away your sins. Deception number four, all you have to do is just accept Jesus or simply believe in order to be saved. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus or the apostles say, accept Jesus. That is not the salvation message. And even though we do have verses like John 3, 16, where it talks about believing and be saved, you need to understand what belief and what faith itself is is because it's not just this mental accepting of Jesus Christ. That is not what true faith is. Instead of just looking at John 3, 16, we need to look at what all of Scripture says. Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 25 through 28, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Acts 10, verses 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Romans 2, 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. James 2, 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Hebrews 5, verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And these are just a few verses from the New Testament. There's plenty more in the Old Testament. It is obedience to God. Faith is faithfulness to God and his commandments. Now, I'm not talking about keeping Moses' law. Or I'm not talking about what Romans, you know, chapter 3 and 4 and what, you know, Galatians is talking about, where it says, by the works of the law, we are not justified. I'm not talking about circumcision. Because if you look at the context, that's what those passages are talking about. It's not talking about God's moral law. It's talking about circumcision. You're not justified by circumcision. As Galatians 5 verse 6 put it, it's not circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. It is faith which works by love. Which points us right back to Jesus in Luke 10 where he says, If you will love God and you will love your neighbor, if you do this, you will live. Faith works by love and it works and it obeys Christ to love God and to love your neighbor. You must submit yourselves. You must bow the knee to the king of kings and follow what he commands. You're not going to enter the kingdom of God if you cannot obey the king's commands. 
Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And lastly, deception number five. Once you are saved, you are always saved, even if you sin. As we talked about before with 1 John 3, 8, he that commits sin is of the devil. You're not of God if you're committing sin, you are of the devil. The Bible also says in Hebrews 10, verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderies, drunkenness, revileries, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Ezekiel 18, verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sins that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So we can see very clearly from the Bible that if you are committing sin, it says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because honestly, if it is obedience that saves, it is sin that leads to hell. I mean, the Bible hasn't changed. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, that doesn't change whether you're a Christian or not. If you commit sin, the wages of that sin will be death. But if you turn from that sin and obey God, you will have everlasting life. This idea that you can get saved at one point and then go off and sin every single day till the day you die, and then you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. You weren't good. You weren't faithful. You're breaking God's commandments every single day. Blaming Adam because you have a sin nature and you're born a sinner and it's not your fault and you're thinking that God's going to be pleased with you. God is not pleased with you as a sinner. The Bible says in Psalm 5.5 5 and Psalm 11.5 that his hatred is toward the sinner. If you choose to live in sin, you are willfully disobeying God. And we see constantly throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is going to destroy sinners. What you need to do is what James chapter 4 says. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You need to submit yourselves to God. Submit to God and not to the devil. You are not under the devil's authority. You are under God's authority and you must obey him and not sin. You need to cleanse your hands. You need to purify your heart. You need to turn from that sin. That's what the self-cleansing is. You cleaning yourself up, cleaning your act up, turning from those sins and saying, no, I am not going to follow sin. I am submitting to God. I am bowing the knee to the King of Kings and I'm going to follow him. Have godly sorrow for that sin and turn from it. Say, enough, I'm making the 180, I'm going to live my life for Christ. He is Lord of my life. Don't be the people Jesus was talking to in Luke 6, 46 when he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I command? If you're going to call Jesus your Lord, you must obey him. And I plead with you to leave these false doctrines, leave these false teachings behind. Pick up the Bible, read it as is and follow the Lord. I want to encourage each and every one of you to study the scriptures, ask the Lord to show you the truth, be a truth seeker, examine the path you are on. If you have any questions, we answer a lot of them on our YouTube channel, One Reality. On our website, theylie.org, you can read on it. If you have any questions for me, you can email me at seekaftergod at gmail.com. I hope and I pray that you'll turn from your sins and follow Jesus Christ and that you will remain faithful to his commands.